in the Menace Reader, under the title, The Religion of Free Man. It's pointed out that despite the natural difficulties which surround any attempt to arrive at the convictions of men who may be said to have been free, one thing is certain. Their ideas are likely to be those which may prosper in an atmosphere of unrestricted reason. Now, no one can quarrel with the claim that a free man is a man who is determined to think for himself. And this freedom of mind, moreover, is of greater importance than political freedom in making a definition. It will be conceded, for example, that Socrates, whose liberty was curtailed by his Athenian judges and whose life was ended by their decree, was nevertheless a freer man than those who condemned him. There's a natural tendency on the part of Americans to think of themselves as free, and, politically speaking, little doubt but that the institutions of the United States afford explicit recognition of the right of human beings to be free. An inquiry of this sort, then, may well begin with an examination of the religion of the men who shaped those institutions. Even if the religion or religions of the Founding Fathers suffer from obscurity, this obscurity may itself be of considerable significance, since the most easily defined religions are not necessarily the best. On the contrary, if true religion is an inward thing, the reverse may be true. One clear contrast between the political leaders of the present and those of the period of the American Revolution lies in their respective relations to the religious orthodoxy of their times. Our present leaders seem to seek orthodoxy with eagerness, as an obligation perhaps of sound politics. The revolutionary leaders, despite political hazards, chose an opposite course. In History and Social Intelligence, published in 1926, Harry Elmer Barnes collected evidence to show that the majority of distinguished Americans in the generation of the fathers were not even professing Christians. Students in intellectual history have observed that the best single example of the ideas of the founding fathers is found in Robert Ingersoll, the great freethinker who came a century later. In a sermon on Ingersoll, a Unitarian clergyman, uh, Minot J. Savage, said his, Ingersoll's, Ideas were very largely those of Voltaire, of Gibbon, of Hume, of Thomas Paine, of Thomas Jefferson, of Benjamin Franklin, and of a good many other of our prominent revolutionary heroes. Back in 1831, a perturbed minister declared with dismay that most of the founders of our country were infidels, and that of the first seven presidents, not one of them had professed his belief in Christianity. In general, the founding fathers have been termed deists. While difficult to define, since all deists have been individualists in religious thought, and there could not possibly have been a deist church, deism accepts the idea of deity as a general providence, but denies the superiority of any miraculous revelation over what may be learned by natural means. In the presidential campaign of 1800, much capital was made by the Federalists out of Jefferson's notorious free thinking. Although Jefferson was so great an admirer of Jesus that he edited for his own use a version of the New Testament, which left out all but the moral teachings of Jesus, he was nonetheless attacked by his political opponents as one who, quote, hated Christ and his church, end of quote, and whose daily speech is that of an infidel. But Jefferson did become president, the freedom of his religion notwithstanding. This was one of the greatest of the achievements of 18th century liberalism and the American Revolution. Men of his views a few hundred years before were hunted, persecuted, and burned at the stake for their beliefs. One of these, Michael Cervantes, suffered attack, imprisonment, and finally death over a slow fire of green boughs at the hands of John Calvin for daring to believe with ancient pantheists that God is eternal, one and indivisible, and in himself inscrutable, but making his being known in and through creation— so that not only is every living, but every lifeless thing an aspect of deity. An aspect of Servetus' heresy was the honor he did demand. In the course of a theological correspondence with Calvin, he wrote to the Genevan reformer, All that men do, you say, is done in sin, and is mixed with dregs that stink before God, and merit nothing but eternal death. But therein you blaspheme. Stripping us of all possible goodness, you do violence to the teaching of Christ and his apostles, who ascribe perfection or the power of being perfect to us. Be ye perfect, even as your Father in heaven is perfect. Matthew, verse 48. You scout this celestial perfection, because you have never tested perfection of the kind yourself, thou reprobate and blasphemer, who calumniatest the works of the Spirit. 
Servetus was a martyr to Protestant fury. He died at the stake on October 27, 1553, and about a half century later, on February 17, 1600, Giordano Bruno, Italian philosopher and pantheist, was led into a public square in Rome and burned to death for similar errors. Spinoza, before another century had passed, was to suffer, if not death, complete ostracism by the Jewish community in Holland, again for the pantheistic heresy. I hold, he said, that God is the imminent, not the extraneous cause of all things. I say all is in God, all lives and moves in God, and this I maintain with the Apostle Paul, and perhaps with every one of the philosophers of antiquity, although in a way other than theirs. I might even venture to say that my view is the same as that entertained by the Hebrews of old, if so may be inferred from certain traditions, greatly altered and falsified though they be. Why should we say, the article in the Manus Reader goes on, why should we say that these had been free men? Largely because they stood for the highest sort of freedom in human life, sometimes dying for it as well. By thinking for themselves, they enriched themselves and the world. It gave them the integrity of conviction which made their own independent conclusions of greater importance than anything else, and so gave an example of lives of principle to all who came after we can hardly avoid the conclusion that the living quality of their pantheistic thought was the source of this integrity and courage. They would submit to no insistent conformity, no outside ruler of mind or conscience. They were not criminals, yet they were treated far worse than common breakers of the law. They were gentle men, teachers, philosophers, devoted to their fellow men. But their religion had one common principle of self-reliance in thought and belief. They, more than any others, they and the few who were like them, are the true authors of human freedom wherever it's found. From the ancient Stoics to the modern Einsteins and Schweitzers is a long course of two thousand years and more. There have been a few bright interludes of civilization and learning, and much longer periods of darkness along this path. But throughout, the religion of free men changes very little, if at all, in its fundamental expression. It is the religion of men who cherish a secret divinity within, however they name it, and who live in the world, whatever it's like, without fear. Disagreeing with popularly held beliefs, doing your own thinking instead of accepting without question what you've been told to accept, has always been the way of unpopularity and danger. How men love to tell others what to think and believe. Calvin Cook surveyed us alive over a slow fire, not because he was an unbeliever. Servetus was a deeply religious man. It was because his religion differed from that of Calvin. Servetus was a brilliant man, one of the most outstanding physicians of his time. One of his discoveries was that the blood circulates through the lungs. And the fact that his life was taken from him in such an agonizing and barbarous way in the name of religion is a terrible thing to think about. Incidentally, Calvin got him only because he had already escaped from the clutches of the Inquisition, which probably had much the same fate in store for him. Freedom is not just the right to think as we believe, but it's also the right of others to think as they believe, and the fact that the United States was founded by men who were free thinkers, who made up their own minds through their own reading and thinking as to what they chose to believe, put a very solid foundation indeed as a very important part of the underpinning of this country. We need to ask ourselves, have I arrived at my beliefs, all of my beliefs, through independent study and meditation, or have I simply followed the lead of others? And just as importantly, do I freely grant to all other men and women the right to believe as they choose, without rancor? That's an important part of what personal freedom is all about. We recommended the Manus Reader in Direct Line 3. It's a great book to take with you on trips and to keep by your bedside. The articles are short and tremendously interesting and educational as is the Manus publication, which we also recommend it. People who do well in the world, being creative and willing to take a calculated risk, are people who manage to overcome the fear of laughter. Anytime you attempt anything in which you risk failure, you run the risk of having people laugh at you. A college professor worked for many years on an invention. He tramped all over New England trying to interest capital in his device for making the human voice travel along a wire. The people laughed at him. It was, of course, plumb idiotic, they said, to suppose that the human voice could be carried along a wire and heard for many miles or even for a single mile. But our old friend and benefactor Alexander Graham Bell could not be laughed out of it, 
and every time we pick up the telephone, we salute the man who stayed on course despite the laughter. Millions of people laughing in derision could not hurt us an iota, but we stand in mortal terror of it. Men and women who can prove themselves heroes in great crises tremble before derision. It's a queer quirk of human nature we probably develop as children. It has cost much. It's changed the history of the world. Sometimes the price of a laugh has meant the slamming of a door of fame and fortune or even immortality. Elias Howe invented the sewing machine, but it nearly rusted away before the American women stopped laughing about it and could be persuaded to make use of it. With their sewing done so quickly, they argued, what would they ever do with all their spare time? So a biographer paints a tragic picture. The man who had done more than any other to lighten the work of women was forced to borrow a suit of clothes on an occasion of a public appearance. Men are as bad as women when it comes to resisting new ideas. The typewriter had been a demonstrated success for years before businessmen could be persuaded to buy it. How could anyone have letters to write, they argued, to justify the investment of a hundred dollars in a writing machine? Only when the Remingtons sold patent rights to the Calligraph Company and two groups of salesmen worked in competition was the resistance finally broken down. Xerography faced the same kind of problem when it was first introduced, and other inventions have had similar battles. Here's an extract from a notebook of Robert Fulton, who invented the steamship, who changed the world from sail to steam on the oceans of the world. He wrote, As I had occasion daily to pass to and from the shipyard where my boat was in progress, I often loitered near the groups of strangers and heard various remarks as to the object of this new vehicle. The language was uniformly that of scorn, sneer, or ridicule. The loud laugh often rose at my expense, the dry jest, the wise calculations of losses or expenditures, the dull repetition of Fulton's folly. Never did a single encouraging remark, a bright hope, a warm wish cross my path. Never did a single encouraging remark, a bright hope, a warm wish cross my path. And that's about what you can expect when you try something new. Emerson once commented that no one ever falls ill, but that passers-by idly hope that he will die. And the same perversity and built-in envy cause people to think or hope that any new idea or plan that runs counter to established principle will fail. Speaking of Emerson, he also wrote, Pythagoras was misunderstood, and Socrates, and Jesus, and Luther, and Copernicus, and Galileo, and Newton, and every pure and wise spirit that ever took flesh. To be great is to be misunderstood. In his one-dimensional man, Herbert Marcuse points out that people now have more opportunity for education, with the classics coming to life and gaining wide distribution, but he says, they come to life as other than themselves. They are deprived of their antagonistic force, of the estrangement which was the very dimension of their truth. The intent and function of these works have thus fundamentally changed. If they once stood in contradiction to the status quo, this contradiction is now flattened out. You know, we tend to forget that the greatest people, the greatest writers, the greatest teachers, were for the most part in violent disagreement with their times and the way things were being done. We seem to have become so flabby in our acceptance of anything that we fail to do anything personally about what we see about us. Norman Cousins has written that the biggest issue of all in the years just ahead is not just the squandering of physical resources, but the squandering of human resources. From the child in school slowed down to a kind of Disney world of happy passivity to the now grown adult, we've come to believe that what is is best. Have we learned to think? Do we look at our products and services, our jobs, with the glaring, critical eye of suspicion, knowing with every fiber of our being that they're not nearly good enough, not nearly what they can be? We have abundant proof that our system of individual freedom works best, but instead of trying to find ways of making it better, we tend to cling to the ways of the past. What constitutes failure? What does a person have to do or not do in order to fail? Herman Melville died in 1891. He wrote the book Moby Dick, the Whaling Epic, with its tremendous metaphysical concept of evil, at the age of 30. The book was published in 1851, sold a few copies, and then was promptly forgotten except by the limited connoisseurs of creative writing. Melville lived 40 years beyond publication of Moby Dick. He considered himself and his book a failure, and from a published point of view, Melville was right. 
Of his other novels, Billy Budd remained unpublished for 40 years after his death, and like Moby Dick, has since become a literary classic. Today, sales of Melville's works run into the millions, but there is no retroactive compensation for the author's troubled soul or shoddy purse. How then shall we measure values, assay excellence, and compensate for obvious neglect and public apathy? Moby Dick, the White Whale, is dead, but Moby Dick, the novel, lives in imperishable print, and with it, Melville moves into the company of the literary immortals. That sort of posthumous fame was by no means restricted to Herman Melville. It's happened to a great many men and women. It was true of Henry Thoreau and Edgar Allan Poe. It was also true of Jesus Christ. So what is failure? Failure does not come to a person because he is not recognized by the multitudes during his lifetime or ever. Our success or failure has nothing to do with the opinions of others. It has only to do with our own opinion of ourselves and what we're doing. Getting back to Thoreau for a moment, when he had to take most of his unsold books back home from his publishers, it didn't seem to bother him at all. In fact, he made the comment that he had a library consisting of over 700 volumes, most of which he had written himself. The only person that can be called a failure is that person who tries to succeed at nothing. Success, as far as a person is concerned, does not lie in achievement. It lies in striving, reaching, attempting. Any person who decides upon a course of action he deems to be worthy of him and sets out to accomplish that goal is a success right then and there. Therefore, failure consists not in failing to reach our goals, but rather in not establishing them. Failure consists of not trying, and certainly Melville and all the others who were not recognized until long after their deaths were successful during their lives because of the fact that they strove all of their lives and gave to their work the best that was in them. And for every Melville that we read about, there have been millions of men and women equally successful, of whom we'll never hear, people who didn't write books or try to save the world, but who, in their own quiet way, in their own places, gave to what they had chosen the best that was in them. Melville must have known, deep within himself, when he finished the last page of Moby Dick, that he had not failed, just as each of us knows how much of himself he's giving to what it's been given him, what he has chosen to do. As we pointed out in the beginning, among all living creatures, man alone is placed on earth without a built-in book of instructions for successful living. He must create his own world within the parameters of the society in which he finds himself. And he can create a good world for himself if he will become free and look for quality in everything he does. If he will learn to think. If he will examine with faint distrust everything he hears and sees and look for a better way. In whatever field he finds himself, he will say to himself every day, There are better ways of doing this. My job is to seek them out. And make as his guidelines in seeking a better way those two unfailing guideposts, quality and simplicity. The force behind every human action is its goal. What's your goal? Is it clear in your mind? And we should not let the doubt and criticism of others shake our self-confidence. Self-confidence is like a psychological credit card. It's good wherever it's presented, and it can command in time unlimited credit, unlimited opportunities. And for every one of our problems, there is a corresponding opportunity for a great career in business or in government or the social services. When something angers you, you're face-to-face -face with opportunity. The thing that made Mark Twain so great was his great burning anger at the inhumanity and ridiculousness of man. The same was true of Tolstoy, Dostoevsky, and Voltaire. And behind every improvement of man was a dissatisfied, critical mind. Advances don't come from groups of happy, well-adjusted, well-integrated people. They come from nonconformists who refuse to buy the status quo, people with a healthy curiosity, a wonderful freedom of mind, and the inner security to take a chance. Here are some interesting questions for you. You might want to try answering them. One, if you could completely change places with any other person in the world, would you do it, and who would that person be? Two, if you could work at any job you could choose, would that work be different from the work you're now doing? Three, if you could live in any part of the country you want to live in, would you move from where you're now living? Four, if you could go back to age 12 and live your life from that point over again, would you do it? Studies indicated that the great majority of people, even though they evince a certain amount of dissatisfaction with their present lives and don't seem to be as happy as they might be, 
will answer no to all four questions. What brought this to mind is an attorney friend of mine who confided that now that he's accomplished everything he's worked and struggled for so long to achieve, he finds himself depressed more and more of the time. He has a fine practice and an excellent income, a beautiful home, a wife and children to whom he's devoted. In fact, everything is finally just as he'd planned it for so many years. And for no reason that he can put his finger on, all the fun and enthusiasm has strangely disappeared. He's listless and unhappy, and he can't think of a single reason why. This has become a common modern melody, and it's what so often happens when a person runs out of goals. This is when the game of life begins to go to pot, and the person needs to remind himself of some of the basic rules for successful, enthusiastic living. And the first rule is that a human being must have something worthwhile toward which he's working. Without that, everything else, even the most remarkable achievements of the past, and all the trappings of worldly success, tend to turn sour. Achieving our life goals can be compared to opening our presents on Christmas morning and watching those we love open theirs. We look forward to the day, plan, and work toward it. Suddenly it's there. All the presents have been opened, and then what? Well, we must then turn our thoughts and attention to other things. The successful novelist begins planning his next book before he completes the one he's working on. The scientist always has something new and challenging to turn to when he completes a project. The teacher has a new class coming up. The young family has children to raise and get through school, the new home to buy, the promotion to work for. But for millions who reach their forties and fifties and find they've done all they set out to do, and that there are no new challenges to give them stimulus and direction, there often comes the most trying time of their lives, the search for meaning, for new meaning. And it must be found if the old interest and vitality are to be restored to their lives, if they're to achieve renewal as persons. If they understand this, even the search for new meaning can bring new interest into their lives. They've got to say to themselves, all right, I've done what I set out to do. Now I must find something new and interesting to do. Getting back to our questions, the thought of going back to age 12 fills most people with a dread bordering on horror. They wouldn't do it for anything. And the upshot of the whole thing is that most people are living lives they themselves have fashioned and have or are getting what they really want, or at least what they're willing to settle for. And when this is brought to their attention, they often begin to get a lot more enjoyment from the life they've got. They begin to enjoy themselves more and realize that things aren't so bad after all. They also begin, the study showed, to look at each other, their marriage partners, and their children in a new light. As one man put it, it had never occurred to me before that my wife had, by marrying me, dedicated her entire life to me, our home, and children. This is an enormous commitment, a total commitment. I realized I'd been treating her far too casually, that I'd been taking too great a gift for granted. We talked it over and got on much better, much warmer terms with each other. It goes to prove that a reassessment of ourselves and our lives is a good idea from time to time. It makes us realize how much more we can do with the lives and circumstances we've got, how we can improve upon them, and embellish them with a little thought and creativity. It's been written that life is divided into three terms, that which was, which is, and which will be. Let us learn from the past to profit by the present, and from the present to live better in the future. Many years ago, when I was recuperating from an operation, someone sent me a little piece I enjoyed very much. It's titled, Slow Me Down, Lord, and it goes like this. Slow me down, Lord, ease the pounding of my heart by the quieting of my mind. Steady my hurried pace with a vision of the eternal reach of time. Give me, amid the confusion of the day, the calmness of the everlasting hills. Break the tensions of my nerves and muscles with the soothing music of the singing streams that still live in my memory. Help me to know the magical, restoring power of sleep. Teach me the art of taking minute vacations of slowing down to look at a flower, chat with a friend, to pat a dog, to answer a child's question, to read a few lines from a good book. Remind me each day of the fable of the hare and the tortoise, that I may know that the race is not always to the swift, that there is more to life than increasing its speed. Let me look upward into the branches of the towering oak, and know that it grew slowly and well. Slow me down, Lord, and inspire me to send my roots deep into the soil of life's enduring values, that I may grow more surely toward the stars. Thank you.